Buonasera a tutti e benvenuti a questo webinar di presentazione dei corsi in lingua inglese offerti dal Dipartimento di uh, Giurisprudenza. Si inserisce questa dei corsi in lingua inglese tra le attività di internazionalizzazione promosse dal nostro Dipartimento. Quest'anno peraltro abbiamo avuto oltre 100 studenti Erasmus in ingresso, molti dei quali seguiranno questi corsi in inglese insieme ai studenti federiciani, favorendo quindi anche una reciproca comprensione fra culture diverse, valore in questo particolare momento della storia europea certamente di innegabile importanza. Uh, per il caso di ricordare che uh, l'internazionalizzazione dei studi, in particolare giuridici, caratterizza il nostro Ateneo fin dalla fondazione del 1224 o certamente del 1239, anno in cui Federico II ammise a frequentare lo studium napoletano anche gli ultramontani, ossia gli studenti d'oltralpe, di paesi diciamo, al di fuori della, della penisola. Um, ho il piacere di eh, portare i saluti del uh, direttore di dipartimento, il professor Sandro Staiano, che purtroppo oggi non potrà essere uh, fra noi, e cedo uh, con piacere la parola alla professoressa Lucia Picardi, che è la coordinatrice dell'area magistrale in giurisprudenza. Prego. Grazie infinite. Io desidero anzitutto porgere il mio saluto ai colleghi, che eh, si impegnano in questo eh, importante sforzo, agli studenti che sono collegati e a tutti coloro che ci ascolteranno. Salutiamo anche il nostro direttore che purtroppo non ha potuto fisicamente o virtualmente diciamo, essere con noi. È con grande gioia e soddisfazione che partecipo per il secondo anno di seguito a questo webinar di presentazione dei corsi erogati in lingua inglese, che si colloca in una linea di continuità anche temporale con l'iniziativa che si svolgerà domani di presentazione dell'offerta formativa del eh, Dipartimento di Giurisprudenza e quindi anche del corso di laurea magistrale in giurisprudenza. Eh, riallacciandomi a quanto appena detto il collega ed amico Arena, eh, eh, mi limito a sottolineare l'importanza dei corsi in lingua inglese nello sforzo di internazionalizzazione del nostro dipartimento che pur, come lui ci ha detto, venendo da lontano, abbiamo cercato poi di eh, come dire, rafforzare in, negli ultimi anni e questo grazie anche all'instancabile lavoro eh, direi non solo organizzativo ma anche poi di tessitura di rapporti internazionali che è condotto da eh, alcuni eh, colleghi. Eh, la, I corsi in lingua inglese, è appena il caso di dirlo appunto, mh, hanno una importanza centrale sia nella nuova offerta formativa del Dipartimento e sia più in generale nella formazione del giurista moderno. E si consentono innanzitutto, agevolano innanzitutto la frequenza da parte degli studenti stranieri, che abbiamo visto essere in numero cospicuo, ma poi eh, danno anche la possibilità ai nostri studenti di destreggiarsi con, e di acquisire familiarità e pratica con una lingua diversa dalla propria. Del resto la eh, conoscenza diciamo, di una lingua straniera, in particolare l'inglese, è oggi un momento necessario, imprescindibile della formazione del giurista moderno funzionale anche a consentirgli di orientarsi in una realtà in continuo movimento, di acquisire metodologie comparatistiche che gli consentano di confrontarsi con altri ordinamenti diversi dal proprio e seppure ve ne fosse bisogno e penso che invece non ve ne sia, ecco eh, in, il momento attuale così drammatico che stiamo vivendo dimostra come il giurista debba anche conoscere le istituzioni, il diritto dell'Unione Europea e debba anche essere in grado di eh, muoversi eh, con riferimento ad istituzioni eh, di, di dimensione globale. Ma, eh, la, e allora, eh, data appunto l'importanza della dimensione internazionale e comparatistica, eh, vorrei sottolineare come la erogazione dei corsi in lingua inglese abbracci diversi settori disciplinari, 
eh, non soltanto quelli eh, più spiccatamente internazionalistici ed euronitari, ma anche i settori eh, storici, eh, oppure eh, nonché mh, romanistici. E questo dimostra come la formazione culturale, la base culturale, eh, dovuta agli, eh, allo studio eh, delle materie eh, filosofiche, storiche, eh, romanistiche, rappresenta una, eh, come dire, uno zoccolo duro del quale non si può fare a meno nella costruzione del profilo del giurista moderno. Ma la erogazione dei corsi in lingua inglese credo sia poi, eh, non possa andare disgiunta anche da una, come dire, una sorta di evoluzione delle, me delle metodologie di insegnamento. Eh, I corsi in questione sono corsi come dire, mh, progrediti, che quindi si collocano eh, in anni successivi al primo e quindi in una fase piuttosto già un po' più avanzata della formazione eh, del, dello studente. E questo probabilmente consente di andare oltre la tradizionale lezione cattedratica e di eh, affinare anche eh, le capacità di ricerca ed argomentative dello studente. Quindi una sorta di salto di qualità anche nelle nei metodi di insegnamento in modo tale da fare della lezione non tanto diciamo, un'esercitazione intellettuale o una dimostrazione di capacità oratoria da parte del docente, ma proprio un momento eh, come dire, di attività positiva della mente dello studente. Ed ecco allora che con questo auspicio e anche con l'augurio che Uh, il numero dei corsi possa aumentare nel tempo e anzi devo fare anche un piccolo mia colpa perché forse noi del professori di diritto commerciale non siamo presenti come invece dovremmo esserlo con un corso anche eh, rientrante nel nostro settore scientifico disciplinare io eh, auguro ai docenti e agli studenti eh, un buon lavoro, un semestre ricco di eh, soddisfazioni e di risultati eh, eh, estremamente positivi. Grazie. Molte grazie, grazie professoressa Picardi, eh, in effetti ci sono alcuni rilievi estremamente puntuali, così come condivido l'auspicio dell'aumento dei corsi erogati in, in lingua inglese, magari anche diciamo, del ramo di, del diritto commerciale, di sicuro interesse per, per gli studenti eh, federiciani e per gli studenti Erasmus. Eh, alcuni di questi corsi in lingua inglese si inseriscono nel piano di studi della laurea triennale in scienze dei servizi giuridici, quindi ora passerei la parola al coordinatore Lorenzo Zoppoli, il quale però non, potrà, non, è, non poteva essere eh, tra di noi Oggi e quindi uh, passerei la parola al professor Delfino per un uh, indirizzo di saluto. Prego. Sì, grazie, grazie Amedeo. Uh, un rapido saluto uh, a nome di Lorenzo Zoppoli, appunto come diceva Amedeo Arena non può essere presente qui con noi. Uh, premettendo che io non sono su, su, nelle 14 ma in LMG01, quindi riferisco diciamo, l'esperienza dei colleghi che sono sulla laurea in scienze dei servizi giuridici. Uh, come sapete la laurea in scienze dei servizi giuridici è al secondo anno di attivazione, quindi c'è il primo e il secondo anno, non ancora il terzo, uh, però un paio, due, tre insegnamenti a scelta uh, sono mutuati, sono, in lingua inglese sono mutuati anche da LMG01 e quindi potrebbe accadere che qualche uh, studente sia interessato, uh, ci siano anche studenti di, di scienze dei servizi giuridici a seguire i, in, i due insegnamenti, due o tre insegnamenti erogati in lingua inglese. Uh, dubito che ci siano degli Erasmus che abbiano opzionato nell'ambito dei scienze dei servizi giuridici uh, e quindi però diciamo ha senso il coinvolgimento di questo corso di studi perché non è detto che non ce ne saranno in futuro perché ci potrebbero essere Erasmus in futuro al momento in cui si completerà il ciclo se ci sarà il terzo anno negli anni successivi eh, ci potrebbero essere studenti interessati eh, anche Erasmus interessati a scienze dei servizi giuridici eh, è capitato nel passato quando noi avevamo soltanto LMG01 Uh, c'erano nei, nei miei corsi di diritto del lavoro dell'Unione Europea degli studenti is, uh, diciamo iscritti in altro Ateneo, in Ateneo di altro paese europeo che non erano iscritti alla quinquennale o alla laurea principale in giurisprudenza ma in lauree triennali 
che hanno seguito, penso, nell'anno accademico 2015-2016, se ricordo bene, il mio corso di diritto del lavoro dell'Unione Europea in lingua inglese, e quindi potrebbe accadere che in futuro ci siano studenti della triennale, Erasmus della tri sulla triennale, quindi interessati a seguire la triennale e quindi anche insegnamenti in lingua inglese. Uh, valgono, diciamo, le, 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 uh, condivido appieno le cose che ha, uh, diciamo, i profili che ha toccato la professoressa Picardi, che sono i profili uh, diciamo, che riguardano anche la laurea in scienze, in scienze dei servizi giuridici. Uh, naturalmente un auspicio di carattere generale, visto che parlo a nome del coordinatore di uno dei due corsi di studi, e che uh, è quello secondo il quale, uh, diciamo, uh, uh, in base al quale i, i corsi in lingua sono, servano anche ai studenti italiani. Cioè, uh, diciamo, uh, la nostra offerta in lingua inglese è erogata, a mio avviso, a favore degli studenti Erasmus, cioè degli studenti che non sono madrelingua italiani, italiana, ma anche a favore di alcuni studenti italiani, cioè di quegli studenti che hanno un profilo internazionale, una predisposizione per l'internazionalizzazione internazio più elevata di altre che magari sono incuriositi, eh, diciamo, eh, sono disposti a seguire un corso in una lingua diversa dalla propria, che però spesso è anche una lingua diversa da quella degli studenti Erasmus, perché eh, raramente gli studenti Erasmus sono madrelingua inglese. E quindi, diciamo, è un terreno neutro, linguistico neutro, neutrale, sul quale, diciamo, eh, si fa l'europeizzazione e anche l'internazionalizzazione, a mio avviso, e potrebbe essere, diciamo, un terreno eh, interessante, almeno questa è la mia esperienza del passato, perché è, è, è il primo anno che ho di nuovo l'insegnamento in lingua inglese dopo quattro, o tre o quattro anni accademici, Uh, e quindi mi auspice questo, indipendentemente dalla laurea quinquennale, laurea magistrale in giurisprudenza, dalla laurea uh, diciamo, triennale in scienze dei servizi giuridici, il mio auspicio è che questo possa essere un terreno fertile per l'europeizzazione e per l'internazionalizzazione interna delle nostre università a partire appunto dal nostro dipartimento. Grazie, grazie. Grazie, grazie Massimiliano e in effetti penso che tu abbia inconsapevolmente citato Michel Godet che nel 18 ottobre del 1963 affermava che eh, soltanto attraverso la cooperazione tra i giuristi dei diversi paesi europei può realizzarsi l'apprendimento del diritto comunitario e quello spirito europeo che è alla base della comprensione comune e della tolleranza e ancora una volta credo che si tratti di valori particolarmente importanti in questa ora buia della storia, della storia europea. Abbiamo sentito più volte parlare di Erasmus, Erasmus che ricordiamo eh, ha anche una madre italiana, eh, Sofia Corradi, e, e quindi con grande piacere eh, passo la parola alla professoressa Valeria Costantino che è il delegata del Rettore per il programma Erasmus. Prego Valeria. Grazie Amedeo, tutto grazie per avermi invitato a, a questa riunione, mi fa molto piacere come sempre intervenire alle, ai, ai meeting organizzati presso il vostro dipartimento che è eh, estremamente attivo nel campo della internazionalizzazione e mh, porto i saluti del magnifico rettore Matteo Lorito e il suo applauso per l'attività intensa in, te, in tema internazionalizzazione che viene svolto nel eh, vostro dipartimento. E, mh, sono molto contenta di vedere quanti corsi vengono erogati in lingua inglese in un dipartimento che ovviamente pur essendo molto grande e molto attivo potrebbe non essere quello con la maggiore vocazione corsi in lingua inglese, non, non, non è una laurea di tipo STEM, di tipo scientifico dove questa vocazione è abbastanza naturale, quindi penso che l'impegno, lo sforzo che viene profuso per creare questi corsi in lingua inglese che eh, sono profondamente d'accordo con il collega che mi ha preceduto non servono soltanto ad accogliere gli studenti internazionali ma soprattutto a creare delle aule virtuali internazionali, delle aule eh, in cui i nostri studenti possano mettersi in gioco con una lingua che è quella eh, 
internazionale utilizzata in tanti, tantissimi ambienti e ma soprattutto mettere in gioco la possibilità eh, di eh, studiare eh, non usando la madrelingua. Questo è un esercizio, penso, culturale di particolare importanza. Eh, quindi non voglio togliere spazio alle presentazioni, invito quanto più studenti possibili italiani dei nostri corsi di studio a partecipare a questi corsi e eh, il supporto da parte del mia, del, dell'ufficio relazioni internazionali e di tutti i delegati all'internazionalizzazione eh, è sempre a favore di tutte queste attività. Quindi ringrazio Amedeo in particolar modo perché è un ottimo organizzatore e, e ringrazio tutti i colleghi che, ripeto, fanno uno sforzo particolare per rendere le aule di Federico II quanto più internazionali possibili. E buon lavoro a tutti. Grazie, grazie ancora Valeria per uh, il saluto del Rettore per, questo, per le parole di apprezzamento nei confronti dell'attività internazionalizzazione del nostro Dipartimento. Tra l'altro oltre l'Erasmus c'è quest'anno un'altra opportunità che è quella del Network Aurora, perché alcuni di questi corsi in inglese saranno offerti anche agli studenti degli Atenei che costituiscono questa alleanza, quindi per esempio l'Università di Amsterdam, l'Università dell'Islanda, dell'East Anglia, di Duisenberg, di Aberdeen e ancora uh, Innsbruck e quindi, diciamo, quindi questo consentirà anche al di là dell'Erasmus o in aggiunta all'Erasmus di creare queste classi, alcune delle quali appunto come dicevi virtuali, dove si potrà uh, appunto uh, realizzare questa, 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 multi, questa pluralità di culture nell'apprendimento del diritto e quindi con, continuo confronto e reciproco arricchimento. La passo ora con piacere la parola alla professoressa Valeria Marzocco, Presidente della Commissione Orientamento. Prego Valeria. Grazie Amedeo, eh, chiudo io questa sessione di, di, di saluti che però contiene anche un, un bel po' di elementi e di stimoli perché innanzitutto nella individuazione della, della platea alla quale ci stiamo riferendo penso che siano state già eh, come dire, messe sul tavolo una serie di questioni che a mio avviso sono anche questioni rispetto alle quali il Dipartimento si è molto impegnato negli ultimi anni sotto il profilo anche del rinnovamento dell'offerta formativa. Noi stiamo parlando di corsi in inglese, io ringrazio molto Amedeo per lo sforzo costante che certamente in qualità di delegato per l'internazionalizzazione di questo Dipartimento, ma anche animato da una passione autentica, eh, profonde nella diffusione e anche nella, diciamo, eh, nella, nella, nella implementazione di questi, di questi corsi. E stiamo parlando di corsi in lingua inglese, e però stiamo parlando di corsi in una lingua inglese che è la lingua giuridica e questo è un elemento estremamente interessante nella misura in cui è vero che noi come facoltà, come dipartimento che chiaramente ha come oggetto un tema che è tipicamente di, appartenente alle scienze umane probabilmente non abbiamo una vocazione dal punto di vista anche della, del, del modo in cui tra di noi no, circola il sapere Uh, nel linguaggio inglese, ma è anche vero che il giurista contemporaneo o la giurista contemporanea non può uh, fare a meno di uh, confrontarsi con un inglese giuridico che non è esattamente l'inglese che naturalmente può essere impartito all'interno di luoghi altri che non siano il Dipartimento di Giurisprudenza. Quindi innanzitutto certamente ancora il mio ringraziamento ad Amedeo che in questo senso um, porta avanti un'iniziativa che certamente si rivolge agli studenti Erasmus, ma si rivolge, sono molto d'accordo, ai nostri studenti, ma anche ai colleghi che naturalmente mettono in campo la scienza del diritto con riguardo a quel modo di insegnare appunto la scienza del diritto che non si confronta solo con una lingua che è una lingua altra, ma che si confronta con gli istituti, con le categorie con il modo di esprimere i concetti che naturalmente una lingua come la lingua inglese chiama in causa. E è, questa non è una sfida, è una realtà. Abbiamo fatto più o meno velatamente, forse con un po' di cautela, forse anche con un po' di pudore, riferimento ai tempi difficili che stiamo vivendo. Eh, sono tempi che paiono non finire mai, ma che ci portano davanti a delle responsabilità che soprattutto chiamano in causa la responsabilità del giurista, dell'interpretazione della realtà che ci circonda, 
ma anche nella capacità di, permettetemi, gestire e quindi interpretare le categorie, perché attraverso le categorie il giurista legge la realtà. Qui è certamente, parlo forse un po' meno da um, referente della, per l'orientamento, un po' più da filosofa del diritto, ma consentitemi questo piccolo riferimento alla, alla, alla mia materia, che mi auguro presto possa essere tra quelle che offrono insegnamenti in lingua inglese, sante chiaramente quella che è la vocazione culturale, storica, che la eh, attraversa. Grazie a tutti e la parola con grande piacere e ascolterò finché posso anche i colleghi che ringrazio. Grazie, grazie ancora Valeria, anche io mi associo a questo auspicio, anche perché si tratta ancora una volta di considerazioni estremamente puntuali, rivolgersi a una platea diversa, impone a volte un ripensamento delle categorie, delle metodologie, e quindi un arricchimento in effetti tanto per i docenti quanto per i discenti, Federiciani, Erasmus, Aurora, e quindi insomma qualsiasi titolo fruitori di questa, di questa offerta didattica. So it's now time to switch to English and, uh, um, uh, and to hand over to the colleagues uh, who are going to offer the 11 modules taught in English um, in the context of the current academic year. And um, just before um, we, um, uh, just before I hand over to uh, Professor Johanne, I'd like to uh, mention that um, uh, this kind of offer, so the idea of offering courses uh, to students from different places uh, is part of the tradition of the University of Naples, Federico II. Indeed, uh, um, the founder of our university, Frederick II, spoke six languages himself, and uh, um, in 1239 he expressly invited to attend the University of Naples um, students uh, from beyond the mountains, so essentially he was referring to uh, students uh, that will come from countries other than, uh, than Italy. So without any further ado, let me hand over to Professor Massimo Giovane, who is going to teach International Protection of Human Rights. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I mean, international Protection of Human Rights uh, is a popular subject among Erasmus students, I must say. Uh, all along also, it's an attraction to local student as well as somebody, <coughs> as Valeria <coughs> uh, said, it's also important uh, this English teaching, not only to Erasmus students, but also to, to local ones. Uh, lessons in my course stretch, stretch from general topics such as uh, the history of human rights and the structures of uh, norms on the protection of human rights uh, the different categories of rights uh, and uh, universal and regional systems as well, of course, of protection, along with this tradition and teaching. We have prepared a special program by inviting activists from uh, Amnesty International to uh, illustrate some present and hugely debated cases about uh, the uh, International Protection of Human Rights. We encourage in our course a frank and open discussion between the audience and the speakers. To this end, we have also invited some uh, national and foreign uh, scholars uh, who will certainly uh, enrich our debate. I would also like uh, to unveil some uh, of the uh, topics we are going to deal in our course. There are many concern rights of groups, personal identity, and gender or ethnic discrimination. They include, for example, gender violence, gender identity, hate speech, apartheid, and racial discrimination. The latter topic will be address, addressed in the light of the recent Amnesty International report on Israel and apartheid, and the discussion <laughs> promises to be a very hectic one. Uh, apart from questions of personal identity and discrimination, uh, our lessons will uh, uh, finally deal with two more interesting topics. Uh, traditional themes such as the prohibition of torture, uh, alas, and never-ending source of problems and obligation 
and uh, and also the, and then another one which is very interesting uh, i think uh, both for scholars and students uh, is derogation to human rights uh, 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 derogation in times of uh, emergency and necessity to uh, human rights especially of course in european convention on human rights uh, well I think uh, welcome to everybody who is interested uh, in my uh, subject, and I will uh, get back the, uh, the the floor to our great Amedeo Arena. Professor Arena, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Iovar. I'm now hand over to Massimiliano Delfino, who is going to teach EU level law. Okay. Massimiliano, okay. have the floor. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you to the colleagues. Uh, um, as I said, I'm going to teach uh, European Union labor law, which is a very um, modern um, uh, subject matter. Um, I, I will try to um, uh, to focus on different aspects of the of these subject matters, uh, uh, starting from a, a historical uh, an historical perspective, uh, dividing a tradition which traditional divides uh, the um, uh, the subject matter in uh, three different uh, historical periods: the period of the market, of the period of social policies. Uh, and the period of the constitutional constitutional constitutionalization of social rights. Um, uh, I'm going to um, uh, to deal uh, with this subject matter according to the um, uh, to the typical uh, partition of uh, uh, domestic labor law, uh, which is uh, the contract of employment on the one hand and the the trade union law on the other hand. Um, and so, according to this partition, I'll, I, I will focus on the on different uh, topics such as the uh, directives on atypical work, the, 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 the instruments of the labor market, uh, uh, the, the directives concerning crisis and restructuring of undertakings, vocational training. Uh, while, uh, on the other hand, uh, I will focus on trade union law, as I said, uh, um, uh, with topics uh, uh, dealing with topics uh, such as uh, uh, the uh, participation, the workers' participation, the, the European social dialogue. Um, I'm deeply interested in the uh, EU labor laws perspectives, uh, which are very, very important uh, in the, uh, during these. Uh, times. Uh, um, I, I would like to um, to make just two examples of the uh, EU labor laws perspectives. The first one is the um, uh, the novelty of a proposal for a directive on adequate minimum wage. Um, and this topic um, means, uh, first of all, asking the question of whether the European Union has the competence to regulate uh, this matter, the matter of uh, pay. Uh, and so during the course, we, um, uh, we are going to follow the, the, the process uh, of this proposal uh, for a directive. And so it, it will be very interesting to follow this process. And the other example, the second example is the um, is linked to two main, two, two important uh, rulings of the Court of Justice and of the EU Tribunal. Uh, and these two uh, judgments uh, deal with the um, uh, one of the key principles of EU European European Union in general, but I think. Europe, uh, European Union labor law in particular, which is the principle of horizontal or social subsidiarity. And this is a, a, a very important topic and I'm going to, to deal with this topic uh, thoroughly. Um, uh, let me conclude my uh, presentation with two items. Uh, the first one is the, uh, uh, the comparison. Uh, I th I'm very interested in the, in comparison, in legal comparison, and so uh, depending on the country of origins of the of the single of the students, uh, I'm going to uh, compare the different legal systems, starting from the EU directives uh, 
for instance, on a typical work or on transfer undertakings, it could be a good idea to um, to make a comparison between the different legal systems, but it depends on the composition of the class. It depends on how many students uh, there will be in the class uh, and uh, it depends on the nationalities of those students. And the second um, item is the items of the interactions with the students. As the students uh, who attended uh, the main course of labor law, of Italian labor law, know, um, I'm very interested in the interactions between and the, the students, uh, among the students uh, and the interactions between the students and myself, since I think that uh, the, the, a lecture um, is interesting when there is an interaction between uh, the teacher and the students. Uh, and not, the lecture is not a conference, a lecture is not a conference, uh, it's not a presentation. And so uh, the interactions uh, among the students and myself and the teacher is uh, an important component of, um, of, of, of a lecture, uh, in my opinion. So I think I'm, I, I can finish here and thank you very much for your attention and thank you to the colleagues. Thank you, Amadeo. Amadeo. Thank you very much, Massimiliano. I would now like to introduce Professor Francesca Galgano, who will teach a course called um, European Legal Science History and Cases. European Juridical Science History Cases. Let me introduce myself. My name is Francesca Galgano and I teach European Juridical Science, History and Cases. I'd like to explain a little about this course, which will be taught in English and it's open to Erasmus students, non-Italian students and why not also to Italians who wish to broaden their cultural horizons. The level of English will be taught at the European Framework B2. However, it is not necessary to be in possession of a B2 certificate. The course proposes an introduction to the juridical culture of modern Europe, based on ancient legal framework containing foundations for both systems of common and civil law. The course aims to provide an in-depth comprehension of the origin and evolution of legal science through methods and techniques used by past juries in solving cases, with a focus on some institutions of European law, especially property, family, contract and obligations, to name but a few. The teaching and learning methods will be as follows the students will be able to identify foundation and evolution of European juridical science through cases. The advantage of such methodology is to install in the students the capacity to analyze text, to identify legal rules and principles applicable to specific cases, to argue logically and, when possible, to give examples and solutions. The course is based on primary materials, which are absolutely necessary to shape one's own assessment on single cases. Through lessons and teamwork held during the course, the students will be able to apply the technical language and know-how. Oral assessment 30% will be conducted during the course and will be finalized through an oral exam 70% at the termination. And now the crucial question, why follow this course? The first approach to European juridical culture will be focused on its history, but the perspective is launched towards today's Europe. Though we can't ignore the influence that a common intellectual tradition has given us, that was consulted and used in medieval Europe, from where it was exported around the globe. It is the base of many modern legal systems today. The quality of this intellectual and juridical culture was extremely high, especially as far as concerning a way of reasoning, of constructing patterns using 
using logic, which has survived throughout the centuries. And finally, another important aspect to be underlined regards European identity, which could be regarded and enforced by the understanding of a common legal culture still present in court decisions and even outside Europe, providing inspiration. Thank you very much. And it's now time um, to hand over to Luigi Ferrara, who is going to teach EU and comparative administrative law this year. Luigi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amedeo. Dear student, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to warmly thank you, Professor Arena, for this webinar and all colleagues introducing us. My name is Luigi Ferrara. I am Associate Professor of Administrative Law. You may find all information about my academic activities on my university personal web page. I am very glad to introduce you the course of Comparative and European Administrative Law. The course provides a comparative introduction into administrative law models in civil law and common law countries. We will analyze administrative system in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom and in USA. Administrative law was built around the key concept of governmental power, linked uh, as a typical national product, closely linked to local tradition. However, from 19th century to date, the comparative analysis was frequently the rationale for relevant statutory reforms of public administration in several countries. You may consider, for example, the recent Italian reform of administrative transparency, starting from the USA model of freedom of information. Administrative courts, similar to the French Council of State, flourish in several European countries, such as in Italy. Scholars and intellectuals were constantly involved in comparative analysis of public discussion uh, the, uh, about the common trends in different countries. In civil law countries, the foundation of national legal sciences involved a process of circulation of principles and tools of administrative law, like the judicial review of discretionary power, the status of administrative procedure, the shape of local government, in UK, DICE and English legal scholarship represented the United Kingdom as an exception to diffusion of administrative law in the name of the primacy of both rule of law and common law system. Today, with the creation of a specific judicial review of administrative activity and a special section of the ordinary courts, UK scholar underlined that even in England, administrative law is a field apart from private law, influenced from an influencing foreign administrative law models. In USA, starting from New Deal reforms in 20th century, scholars told about the rise of the administrative state in America. The American system of administrative law moves away from common law tradition and suggests trend and issue very interesting in comparative perspective with civil law countries. The constitution and administrative law interact to shape the rights and duty of citizens due to activism of courts. In this course, I will show you the leading cases which in each country shape the physiognomy of national system. The course focuses on the following topics. We will start from a technical methodological choices which a comparatist had at disposal. Functional comparison, structural comparison, systemic comparison and critical comparison. We will analyze in selected each country the administrative organization and the general principle, the shapes of public administration, activity and right of citizen, general law regulating the administrative procedure, the judicial review of discretionary power and administrative courts and tribunal, the local government. We will analyze the convergence and integration among national models today. In particular, we will analyze the so-called European administrative law and so-called global administrative law. Over the last decades, the European Union has developed a series of ad hoc administrative procedures for a direct implementation of its rules. The German scholar Schwarze proposed that the European integration process 
had been built around a community of administrative law and that the new EU administrative law influences national administrative law. Over the past 30 years, the process of globalization impacted upon a legal institution as much as the economy. Global regulatory regimes, intergovernmental organization, global standard, and so on, developed the principles and rules that are mainly administrative in nature, related to the process of law, procedural fairness, transparency, participation, due to give reason and judicial review. With Kingsbury, we could define global administrative law, the legal framework of this mechanism, principle, and practice. The course addresses both Italian and Erasmus students and will be carried out in Italian and in English. The course consists of lectures and seminars using slides in English. Registration and regular attendance in lectures are recommended. The lecture timetable might be changed and agreed with, students and, uh, with attending students. The final exam will be a comprehensive oral discussion. Attending student may agree an intermediate exam with lecturer. The text for final examination are one handbook and one paper, both at the choice. Student can choose one book between two suggested handbooks in Italian and English, and one paper among several suggested papers. Suggested paper and course slides will be given to the attending students. All news and information will be published on my personal university website. The skills that attending students may get are the knowledge of administrative law in some foreign countries and EU and global administrative law, the understanding of the trends of future reforms in administrative matters, and the capability to promote themselves as experts for careers abroad. Attending students are welcome in preparing their final examination thesis. I will help them to study in foreign universities. Thank you for your attention and enjoy my course. Thank you, thank you very much, Luigi. And I will now hand over to Marcello Stella, who um, is going to teach international and comparative procedural law this year. The floor. Thank you very much, Avedeo, and welcome uh, to everybody. And so my course is about civil justice uh, in a comparative uh, and transnational perspective. So it is sort of a blended course. I try to, in the first part, uh, give a little brief bit of a history of the main procedural law families in the European landscape. That would be Germany, France, the UK, and Italy, of course. And we try to um, grasp what the main values underlying the civil justice systems are. And we do that by having a look at the main phases of civil trials. So the introductory phase, the taking of evidence, the appeals available against decisions, and finally, the res judicata uh, effects. Um, and also a brief look at summary procedures, summary judgments. Uh, it is really a great, fascinating time to take, uh, uh, this is the second year I'm taking this course uh, at uh, the Naples University, uh, really fascinating time as in all member states right now, or in the last two or three years, there has been um, a great amount of uh, reforms of the procedural law systems and and all those reforms and main remarks, values, have an impact, a tangible impact, when we shift to the transnational perspective. So when we deal with transnational litigation and issues of jurisdiction, taking of evidence, recognition and enforcement of judgments, all those peculiar features of each um, civil justice system, they really become evident. And, and so in the second part of the course, I focus on especially um, <clears throat> the civil commercial litigation. And in particular, we deal with uh, regulation 1215 of 2012, the Brussels uh, one piece regulation. Uh, so we have a look at uh, issues about international jurisdiction and recognition of judgments. Uh, in the course, I will show uh, students different judgments by different courts in the, of the member states 
the style of reasoning of judgment tells a lot about the procedural systems. We will have a look at the main case law by the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, of course. I will assign uh, short uh, English language readings, brief readings by comparative procedural lawyers uh, and, and of course attendance and participation in classes will be also uh, evaluated in the overall um, uh, final oral exam. There will be a sh an oral exam at the end of the course and, um, and that will be it for my course. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much, Patricia. So I'll now um, um, hand over to the presentation, of course, of history, modern and contemporary codification. So we have uh, Professor Dolores Freda, uh, connecting from our Faculty of Law. Dolores, you have the floor. Thank you, Amedeo. Thank you to everybody. Uh, well, a uh, history of modern and contemporary uh, codification uh, focuses on uh, the idea and process of codification in Europe. Uh, and starting from the affirmation of the modern state in uh, the uh, 16th century and enhanced uh, first by the uh, natural law theories, then by the Enlightenment, uh, concentrates on the enactment uh, uh, of the 18th century, more or less, of the main modern and then contemporary codes of law. And um, it should be noted that uh, it is true that such a process, uh, um, such a history concerns especially uh, continental Europe. At the same time, the debate uh, on codification developed widely in the common uh, law world, uh, enhancing the codification process itself um, all over Europe and all over the world. Um, furthermore, um, particular attention uh, is given in the course uh, to the debates, uh, to the theories, uh, of course, with an eye to the most recent uh, uh, historiography or, well, historiographical and doctrinal uh, scholarship, um, which contributed to the uh, evolution of codified law in the 20th century, uh, with particular reference to the historical experience on one hand, but also on future perspectives on the other of the form code uh, itself, uh, especially in present debate on the uh, EU European law. And uh, if possible, I will just add uh, I would like to add that uh, uh, the educational offer available uh, uh, in the uh, legal historical field is not limited uh, uh, for this year, but especially for the next year, to history of modern and contemporary um, constitutional law, but uh, uh, includes also some other subjects, as for example, history of criminal law, uh, which uh, focuses on the development uh, uh, for the centuries uh, of criminal legal thought, criminal process, criminal systems in an historical comparative perspective, history of the legal professions uh, on the origins and development of the legal professions, so advocacy, judges, notaries, uh, with particular reference to Italian legal culture, but also in a comparative uh, European perspective. And last but not least, um, history of labor law uh, on labor legal history, uh, always in an international uh, framework or perspective, which crosses, in this case, women labor issues and migration related issues. So that's all for uh, the historical uh, uh, subjects. And I thank you very much. Let me thank you, Dolores. That was uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. So let me now hand over to Loredana Strianese, um, who will teach a course called Decentralized Finance, Policies and Laws. Hello everyone, I would like to thank Professor Arena for this user of fine initiative which gives us the opportunity maybe in a few minutes to present our course. Well, I introduce it now. I'm Loredana Sanese and my course is called Decentralized Finance Law. 
It is a course of choice in the 50 years and it deals with the financial autonomy of regions and other territorial entities. The subject of the study is a history of fiscal federalism in Italy and the constitutional reforms that have characterized it. In particular, it focuses on the study of local taxes and their wide development and the different territories, especially because many of them have an extra fiscal connotation because of being special purpose taxes, the revenue obtained from their collection is used for the preservation of cultural and artistic heritage and also for environmental protection. The tourist tax or the landing tax, for example, are very effective, uh, effective taxes and are also applied in other tourism-oriented countries around the world, not just in Italy. They help to finance local budgets by encouraging and supporting the implementation of public works on the territory in favor of the environment and the landscape protection. These are very innovative topics because they are currently the subject of many legislative reforms aimed at developing the competencies and these bodies, especially with regard to the management of the new PNRR and therefore to the realization of works on territory that are useful to the citizens living in the individual territories. Foreign studies will be granted a simplified examination program. I will stop here and thank you for your kind attention. Bye. Um, it is now time to hand over to Francesco De Santis, uh, um, who is going to teach procedural aspects of human rights protection. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amadeo. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, dear students. It is a real pleasure to me to have the opportunity to present my, my course. Uh, this course is a procedural aspect of the international protection of human rights. I, I, I held it uh, in Napoli University, in Federico II University, uh, right since uh, I got back from my working experience at uh, the registry of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so just to, uh, as, a, as a teaser of, let's say, of, of my course, I, I would like just to, to remind that today, the European Court of Human Rights has granted um, urgent interim measures in application concerning military operations on Ukrainian territory. Uh, those um, interim measures had, had to be granted uh, um, ruling on a request um, brought um, by Ukrainian government pursuant to Rule 39 of the Court Rules of Procedure. Maybe for, uh, for let's say, the majority of, of the students who will, uh, who will look at this video, uh, what, what I said so far is totally meaningless. Uh, and uh, you will you will discover what uh, I was talking about uh, during my course. Um, my uh, this subject is is focused on the mechanisms for the international protection of human rights, uh, international mechanisms, and a special focus is uh, is made on the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which is the let's say, accordingly known as the most important international court for the protection of human rights in, in the entire world. Um, my perspective is not only that of an international lawyer, but also the one of an associate professor of civil procedure. So um, we will study it from starting from a technical perspective, uh, thinking of the uh, Strasbourg court as a, a Supreme Court, Supreme Court of Europe in a way. Um, what what can I say? Let just me add that you will find all the information on my course on my teacher web page. Um, actually, um, I'm glad to to repeat what my colleagues said today. This is during the years this course has been attractive not only for Erasmus students, and I'm glad to have Erasmus students because I I like to to continue this idea of building an international environment in our university, but real one with, with uh, human exchange from people. 
but it's, it, it, this course has been very catchy also for, and mainly I would say for Italian students, for students who wanted to, to continue an international career after uh, their graduation. Um, and apparently this, it has been of, of some help. So you are the most welcome every Thursday and Friday morning in room 32, starting from nine o'clock. And um, I can assure you it will be interesting. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. And I think I hand over to Professor Giovanni Zara, who is going to teach EU private international law. Giovanni, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Amedeo. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce my topic in this okay. seminar. Um, actually, private international law is today crucial in EU private relationship because, uh, as you know, free movement of people is going to uh, increase the number of uh, uh, relationship between people coming from different countries, as well as increasing the number of uh, uh, legal relationship involving an element of uh, a foreign element with regard, for example, to the delivery of goods or, or something similar. Let's think even about uh, a, a journey of somebody from Italy to France or Portugal or Spain or whatever. Um, I uh, will teach this topic uh, as uh, I actually learned it in, uh, in the UK when uh, I was a student, uh, an LLM student at Queen Mary University of London. And uh, I will provide students with slides concerning the topic in advance. The lectures will be oriented uh, by the EU regulations on private international law. So very few space will be given to the Italian law on private international law, which is more or less completely disapplied today. And um, obviously, the explanation of the topics will be uh, driven by um, case law. So mainly we will analyze decisions from the Court of Justice of the European Union and discusses the various topics on the basis of the practical approaches related to the various uh, issues that will be uh, analyzed in the uh, during the course. Um, I think it's uh, enough. I, I'm very, I very welcome people interested in the topic and I'm available to uh, answer to any question in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. So now I'll hand over to uh, Professor Loris Marotti, who is going to teach international investment law and arbitration this year. Loris, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Amedeo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, the module will be on international investment law and arbitration, which is, a, a, I would say, a very fascinating and modern topic uh, and a very intriguing branch of modern public international law. It's deals with the protection of foreign investments and it is based on a tension between this need of protection uh, of investors and the need to uh, protect uh, and safeguard states regulatory uh, autonomy uh, so it's a very uh, it's a very pressing uh, topic and uh, uh, it has a long history uh, and now it has there has been a very long and very important evolution in this topic since the 60s. So we had a, a proliferation of investment treaties and a proliferation of uh, investment uh, arbitration, so-called ISDS. So the case where an investor can sue the state uh, before an investment tribunal. So in, in the module during classes, we uh, will discuss and we'll examine all these uh, issues and all issues related to the public international law issues um, uh, stemming from this uh, very particular branch of international law. Uh, the course will be uh, divided into six parts, so we will have a first part based on the history of international investment law, then we will move to definition of investment, of investors, and then we will move to the analysis of the standards of protection of, invest of investors and investment, and then we will move to uh, ISDS, so the arbitration between states and individuals and investors, and finally we will uh, address um, a very uh, pressing and important topic, which is the new approaches taken by states and international organizations such as the European Union towards the um, investment system. Uh, so classes will be 
based on uh, an approach uh, which would be based on the dialogue between me and you, students. Uh, so I will try to promote interaction and discussion with students. And let me also say that if you uh, get bored of my voice, I will uh, also uh, invite guest speakers, external speakers, which, uh, who will uh, discuss with us um, more specific topics. So we will have uh, seminars on other and more specific topics uh, on international investment law. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Loris. It is now time to uh, say a few words about the um, uh, course I will be teaching this semester, um, which is called uh, European Union Law in Action. So what is that about? Um, essentially, this course will focus on uh, fundamental freedoms of the EU internal market on the one hand, and on EU competition law on the other hand. So did you know that you can freely travel, walk, study, set up a company, invest in money in uh, 26 other member states different from Italy. Well, this is thanks to the fundamental freedoms of the internal market. Uh, instead, the goal of competition law provisions is to ensure uh, low prices for consumers, uh, product variety, service variety, as well uh, as uh, continuous investment in innovation by private companies. Um, and, and, and the Treaty of Rome in 1957 introduced uh, these two sets of provision on internal market and on competition law to pursue these goals, which of course are conducive to the overall goal of the European Union, which is uh, integration and peace in Europe through economic integration. Um, so this course will adopt a flipped classroom methodology. So that means that the student will be in the driver's seat. The student will be assigned uh, one case to report on, and he or she will report on this case and discuss this with other students in an interactive uh, fashion. Um, um, and also, part of this course uh, will be um, made of guest lectures. We have already five confirmed guest lectures from other member states, and some of them in particular are practitioners which uh, enables me to point out the title of this course. It's called EU Law in Action, because it's not only what you can read in the books, but it's also what happens in practice. And so to get a better idea of how EU law actually affects the life of people, uh, um, the uh, bottom line of companies, um, we will um, have uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, the application, especially of competition laws, with lawyers, so people um, that uh, um, apply these provisions on a daily basis. Um, uh, finally, um, why should you pick this course? Well, first and foremost, to get a practical insight um, of your rights as a European citizen. Uh, so, uh, and that is also part of a, uh, an empowerment process. Second, uh, to experiment uh, with a new interactive methodology that might be different from the one you are used to. And uh, finally, uh, to um, interact in a multicultural environment that will provide some valuable experience should you wish to pursue part of your legal education or um, your career, your future career um, in, uh, in the whole EU, um, in the whole, the whole European Union. So, and uh, uh, with this, I think uh, I can thank all the colleagues uh, who were uh, so kind to take part in this webinar today. Thank you very much, everyone. And I guess we'll meet uh, all the students uh, in the classroom.